Okay, let's start with the uh, second session. Um, we called it Parallel Fears Overcoming Divergent Threat Perceptions. And um, this is very much concentrating on the countries um, within the Eastern Partnership. Some call them in-betweens. You could call them the Eastern European Six. Um, and this is Armenia, Azerbaijan, Georgia, Belarus, Ukraine, and Moldova. Before we start, I just would, even though we heard many things in the session we had before, a very short um, overview where we are, especially concerning those six countries. So first of all, the European security is under threat. I think this is very much understood. The events in Georgia in 2008, and in Ukraine 2014 are symptoms, not the roots of the crisis we are in. I think this is very important. Um, in comparison to the Cold War, as I had said in the beginning, is that we have many more stakeholders countries today. It is much more complicated and challenging to come into terms with security. The fourth, country, uh, the fourth point is that these six countries of the Eastern Partnership are confronted with an increasing insecure environment. And um, one of the main reasons for that, but not only, is that we do have, and this was mentioned in the session before, this was also mentioned in the OSCE final document of the imminent persons, a completely different perception of the last 25 years. Now, this panel is here to have a short look back because the analysis about the perception has been written a couple of times but because we have a very distinguished panel um, and I come to that back later I think it is useful if all the four panelists have a short look back on that different perception because the underlying question is how come that after 25 years of the end of history the so-called and many times quoted um, description, what we have after 89 and 9, that now everybody feels threatened. The EU feels threatened, the country of the Eastern Partnership feels threatened, and Russia feels threatened. So what went wrong? But again, this should be a short portion. And the most important one is to look ahead. And clearly, we're not looking for permanent answers. We're not going out of this room and say, ah, we found it. Clearly not. But if we look forward, we, are, we, are, we could have two paths. The one path is we're looking for a huge agreement. And you might call it Helsinki 2, you might call it, I don't know, Vilnius 1, whatever. Or is it more that the status quo we have at the moment is actually, for many countries, the best we have? So what we have to do is we have to manage the status quo. The only problem is, and that's why we're sitting here on this panel, is that the countries of the Eastern Partnership, I guess, are not very happy with the status quo. So what does that mean? And um, to do this, to discuss this, I think we have a very good panel um, for different reasons. First of all, we have two representatives of the countries of the Eastern Partnership. We have one panelist from Russia, and we have one panelist from the EU, so to speak. Also, we have two practitioners and we have two academics. So this is, I think, the best you can get from such a panel. Um, Maya Panjikice, welcome. Uh, she is the former Minister of Foreign Affairs um, of Georgia. Um, we had a couple of talks. You uh, were very active um, the last couple of years. Thank you very much for coming. Uh, Mr. Alexander Charlie, he is the former first um, Deputy Foreign Minister of Ukraine. He was also advisor to several presidents. Ambassador Charlie, thank you very much for being here. We have Mark Galliotti um, from, um, from London, from Great Britain, um, but he works here in the Czech Republic um, and he's a very distinguished academic on security issues. And of course, Mrs. Abatova, thank you very much for coming too. She is from the IMEMO, uh, one of the biggest institutes in Russia, and she has been around for many years and has written 
and talked on this issue for many years. So I would suggest that we start with uh, Mrs. Panjikite. Um, we'll try to keep um, towards the eight to ten minutes each presentation, please not longer. So we have a discussion with us, with you, but also we would like to have a discussion um, on the panel on a couple of questions. So please go ahead. Thank you very much, Reinhardt, and uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me to this very interesting event of Security Days of OSCE. Thank you personally, Mr. Lamberto Zanier, for inviting me. I appreciate it very much. And um, also the Friedrich Ebert uh, Stiftung, uh, which gave us the wonderful opportunity to enjoy Prague, this wonderful city, and to be here uh, today. So I'm very glad that now uh, Georgian and Ukrainian representatives are on the panel because uh, everything what we heard before was a little bit theoretical for me. And now we can speak from the practical uh, point of view and from our perspective, which is very important, uh, of course. To be honest, when I got the invitation to this um, security days, I was a little bit disappointed because the concept note and the introduction to our panel only mentioned the crisis in Ukraine, that the European security was undermined after the crisis in and around uh, Ukraine, and there was nothing said about Georgia. And this morning also Georgia was mentioned only once, uh, and it was also disappointing uh, for me, because I have the feeling that Georgia is forgotten by the international community and by the international uh, organizations. Uh, why it happened? Uh, I have an answer on this question. Uh, we all remember 2008, and we all remember how the OSCE uh, mission left Georgia a few months later. We tried together, uh, Mr. Zanier, myself as a minister, and other authorities in Georgia to restore uh, the OSCE mission uh, in Georgia, but uh, unfortunately we did not have uh, success. Uh, after the OSCE left Georgia, EU became the major player in the region and especially in the crisis uh, in Georgia. And EU did uh, really a very good job. Uh, EU uh, brokered the ceasefire agreement and the war was stopped after only five days, which uh, did not happen in Ukraine, uh, for example. EU assigned a special representative um, uh, on uh, the conflict uh, with Russia and uh, later on the Geneva International talks uh, were initiated to uh, deal with the consequences uh, of the war uh, in Georgia. And many other steps like the non-recognition policy, supporting the UN resolution uh, on refugees and IDPs, so uh, EU was the major player in the region. Um, and after all these measures were introduced, uh, very quickly Georgia was forgotten. Maybe the answer is uh, exactly what happened, that everything was on the ground, every measure to solve the conflict, and it was no need to be active involved in the conflict solution. Um, 2008 was almost 10 years ago. And uh, when I met this morning Gernot Erler, my uh, old friend uh, from Germany, he asked me, uh, what's news? And what, I'm, I'm very curious what you will say. And I told him, you know, I will say the same because nothing has changed in the past nine years. And maybe when we meet each other 10 years later, my answer will be the same because nothing is changing uh, on the ground and we are still facing the occupation, illegal occupation of two territories of Georgia. We are facing at the same time the annexation of Crimea, the war in Ukraine, which could not uh, be stopped uh, uh, as quickly as it happened in the Georgian case. So what to do? This is the main answer of today's panel. And, uh, it was amazing that yesterday the moderator of the panel asked this question in Russian and he repeated this question several times. So I thought, why is he doing this? And maybe the answer is that this question begs the answer from Russia because they can give us the answer, what is to do? And I have two uh, answers on this question. One is very simple. 
just fulfill the international obligations, just fulfill the commitments, fulfill, in Georgian case, the ceasefire agreement. Here was mentioned the Minsk package. Just simply fulfill it and the conflict will be solved. And another answer is complicated and we can speak about concrete steps. And these concrete steps always are always complicated. One of the concrete steps could be, for example, the restoration of the OSB mission, and there are some others. We can talk maybe about this uh, a little bit later. Uh, many times was mentioned that the trust is shaken, and I agree completely, the trust is shaken. It's very difficult to trust the partners. We, have, we had two armed conflicts in the OSC area, and uh, we are unable to solve this conflict. Of course, that's the reason uh, that we have uh, no trust, we have no confidence. And the best way to restore trust and confidence is to solve the conflict and to showcase that it is possible. It's possible to be part of a solution and not always the part of a problem. And uh, that's sometimes things um, appear very difficult, but in reality, they are very simple. So that, this is my answer uh, to this uh, very important question, what to do? Fulfill the international commitments and the conflict will be solved. It will be a very good uh, possibility to restore trust and when there is a trust between the uh, participating states, it's easy to deal with each other and to discuss issues, to find common language. How can we find common language today? when I believe that Abkhazia and South Ossetia belong to Georgia and the Russian Federation thinks that they are independent states. How can we uh, find a common language when I believe that uh, Crimea belongs to Ukraine and the Russian Federation thinks that Crimea is a Russian territory? So, uh, of course, there are some other fields of cooperation and maybe it's the best way to use them to build the trust between us but it will be only, um, yeah, uh, it, it, will, it will not help uh, to uh, restore uh, peace in the OSC area. We just need very concrete, very uh, strict uh, steps to do so. And I hope very much that this conference and this panel can contribute to these concrete measures, what can be done to improve the situation in the OSC area. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think we'll do one round on the panel and then uh, we'll, go, we'll get into questions also among each others. Mr. Charlie, I think you should be the next uh, from Ukraine, please. Okay. I represent country in between, Ukraine. So I look at situation and perspectives of European security from Ukrainian point of view. A person who have a huge experience in practical diplomacy, negotiate, the most important documents which define the Ukrainian security st status now. But I am not official. My position, maybe not 100% uh, coincide with official position. But as a rule, my ideas earlier or later become official positions. So, from point of view of Ukraine, where we are now, after the illegal annexation of Crimea and aggression, Russia aggression in Donbass, I excuse Ambassador Lukashevich, but it's our position. I respect your position, but you have a right to respect my position. To us Ukrainians, the European OECE security order destroyed totally and finally. Honestly to tell not only Russia in West in this killing of OSCE security order. Azerbaijan-Armenia conflict, bloody disintegration of Yugoslavia, Serbia, Kosovo, Georgia situation, all of this destroying the OSCE security space. But the situation with Ukraine very unique because only in this case, the first time after the Second World War, one country illegally annex the territory of another country. We honestly discussed this question during the work of our panel of eminent persons. 
And it was very informal discussion. It was a moment when all members from West and East agreed that Kosovo was also a mistake from the West. But one of the panelists cried out, but we, the Western countries, never declare Kosovo the part of Great Britain or the part of France. Only you, Russia Federation, uh, do illegal annexation, the first illegal annexation in, in, in the 21st century. And we, during our discussion among panelists, agree that where we are now, in security, since we now at the end of 50s, when security in Europe was totally unstructured and practically not exist any red lines. Practically, from notion of real politics, neither Helsinki, neither Charter of Paris, in real terms, they are not in force because not exist consensus among all members that all changes in European security order after the 1991 uh, are supported all members of OECE, all members of even EU countries. I can remember that Kosovo not recognized this member of EU and never recognized, I'm sure. So to my mind, all of us, from my point of view of Ukrainian, all of you and we also invest in this is disorder of European security space. What, where we are now in Ukraine? In Ukraine situation very, very mm, fragile. Because Ukraine, mm, uh, Minsk process practically impossible to implement. And Minsk process now it's obvious for all of us. It's not about peaceful settlement of Ukrainian crisis. It's about ceasefire. And after three years, we even not implement the first element of Minsk process. So something wrong with this process. What possible to do? I uh, agree with a lot of uh, presentation during the first session, and my uh, idea is the following. Ukrainian crisis and situation around of Ukraine, the most dangerous challenge to European order, without settlement, not ceasefire, without uh, uh, permanent settlement of Ukrainian uh, crisis, peaceful settlement of Ukrainian crisis, it will be impossible to restore sustainable European security order. So, to my mind, our reaction till now is the most dangerous. Practically, we follow the policy neither peace, neither war. Hybrid aggression, hybrid answer, hybrid peace. So to my mind, now we in crossroad and we can adopt one of two positive possible strategic <coughs> decisions. To follow some ideas of the pr prominent presentation in first, uh, first session that our future security model will be indivisible, it's a positive scenario. It means that means have to be implemented. But it means automatically that you, West and Russia, find your common model of European security where for such country as Ukraine, you define a security status, which you agree both and we agree with this status. Practically now you know that one of possible solution of this uh, situation that Ukraine in some way follow the way of Austria after the Second World War or Finland after the Second World War. So it will be compromise. But to my mind now, I personally for this scenario, but I, as a professional diplomat, I see not a lot of trends, mainstreams that follow to this scenario. I think now have a good chance to be realized another scenario. When we divide, European security space, it was declared that uh, uh, trends, indivisibility, but division of, uh, uh, fragmentation of European security space, and we construct some kind of a new Berlin Wall inside of Ukraine, and divide West and East, and start to renegotiate 
a reconfirmation of new Helsinkiya. So, to my mind, this scenario means 100% as soon as possible to deploy peacekeeping security forces on the line of division. Maybe OSCE forces, but it's something new practice for OSCE, but now OSCE is so much in West, why not? But maybe OSCE with United Nations uh, component, but the key task to stop exchange of fire, to stop to kill people. And then to start a new data. To my mind, we need some strategic ideas. Idea of new data, I think a very, very positive because we have to create, re-establish some new Helsinki process. Maybe we call it Kyiv process, and maybe it will be uh, some special responsibility of Ukraine to invest in finding the compromise, which permit to restore uh, order, Helsinki order. And a key idea not to rewrite uh, the principles. The key idea to find a coincide interpretation from all sides what these principles means now and how they can implement. And the key idea, a key idea, 30, 30 seconds, key idea to stop use of force. Everything possible to do, but please, only diplomatic way. So our report is called back to diplomacy. And from this point of view, to my mind, now Europe tried to decide Ukrainian crisis in a very special way. You, European, treat this crisis as Ukrainian Russians. Russia treats this crisis as internal. But in practically, this multi-factor crisis, this is your geopolitical war with Russia, West and Russia over Ukraine. This is your geoeconomic war between EU and Russia over Ukraine. This is our heritage of our uh, old relations with Russia. And this is, of course, some internal tensions inside of Ukraine. If we want to decide this crisis, we need a uh, systematic, uh, multilateral approach to this crisis. I am sure now we are in position to find a new platform for Ukrainian peaceful settlement. Two choices for platform. A new European summit, which will be prepared one, three, two years, maybe with four basket plus ecology. Or, if it's not possible, a special European, pan-European conference on Ukraine like Madrid conference on Palestine. So with, uh, I think we need multinational platform for in proper way to manage the Ukrainian crisis. Without clear understanding future model of European security, divided or indivisible, Russia never, never agree some kind of compromise in the Ukrainian crisis. This is why my message. Thank you very much, Mr. Charlie. Um, so, uh, Nadia, now we heard um, the idea of uh, Mrs. Panjikitsa saying basically Russia has to fulfill all the obligations in Georgia and in Ukraine, and that would build trust, and then we can go on. And Mr. Charlie said it's either neutrality or possibly a cementation of the divide we have, and then from then go on and have a... Um, a new conference, whatever. I, uh, the conference on Palestine was, as we know, the Middle East is still in turmoil, so I hope this is not your <laughs> what you're looking for. No, no, no I, I'm, coming, I'm coming back we to you. We have a few more Nobel Prize. Uh, yeah, but, but, but the problem is still there. Uh, Nadia, so Russia is always mentioned as usual, so what's your take on this? Um, may, maybe, again, sh super short on the perceptions, and then your ideas what to do, ideas. Yes. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation to this interesting uh, event, and it's always a pleasure to be in Prague and in this beautiful palace. Uh, I would like uh, to raise several questions in my short presentation, and let me start with the first one. Is it possible to um, achieve better understanding of mutual cons threat uh, concerns? I think it is impossible. Uh, Russia and the West look at the same events from the very distinct, distinct lenses and have very different interpretations of the same events. Even I, who belong to the most pro-EU community, or better to say minority in Russia, have completely different interpretations 
of, uh, well, of why it went wrong. And you, uh, uh, you have mentioned, uh, Reinhardt, uh, the status quo. The first difference starts with the, um, with the starting point for the definition of status quo. What is bipolar status quo? Is it the end of Cold War, which resulted in Paris Summit in November 1990? Or is it uh, the end of bipolarity, which happened one year later in 1991 with the collapse of the USSR and Yugoslavia, and when nothing resulted from these radical changes, because the general perception was that since it was the East that collapsed, uh, we should not change anything. We should go on. <laughs> or is it uh, NATO's decision on NATO's enlargement eastwards? Or is it uh, NATO's uh, military intervention in Yugoslavia in 1999? Many people say that uh, Russia is involved in uh, Ukraine uh, and Putin uh, recognized that Russian volunteers were in Ukraine. But I think that the first example of military intervention in Europe was NATO's military, whatever the reasons, uh, NATO's military uh, airstrike campaign. So we see it's very difficult to achieve, uh, to reduce our differing uh, perceptions. And I, sh I, I think that we should not waste time and efforts to persuade each other that we are right and you are wrong, but rather to focus on common legally binding rules of behavior along the model of Helsinki Act or Paris Summit. It's all the more so since the current situation in terms of tensions uh, reminds us uh, about uh, the Cold War. But I think that this uh, peace conference or security summit cannot take place if we have uh, Ukrainian conflict going on. Peace in Ukraine is central. So first of all, we should focus on this. And if, um, if the conflict is, is resolved, uh, a new peace conference should focus on three main contradictions of uh, our time. Two contradictions were inherited from the Cold War era, uh, contradiction between territorial integrity and uh, nation's right, uh, right for determination, contradiction between sovereignty and um, a nation's right for humanitarian intervention. But the last contradiction uh, appeared in the post-bipolar era, and it is a contradiction between the right of nations to freely choose uh, and join security alliances and the right of nations to organize their national security according to their threat perceptions. Look at the Baltic area. Uh, Russia's military deployments in the Baltic area uh, look very scary to the Baltic states. But if you look at the bigger picture, at the balance of conventional forces between Russia and NATO, it looks very scary to Russia. Um, can we, uh, can we uh, reduce our tensions? Yes, we can. This situation is not uh, new, and even in the Cold War time, we succeeded in uh, making compromises and reaching very important agreements like Helsinki Act. And uh, um, Francois, uh, said that uh, European security is divided, I fully agree with you, and uh, it will remain divided. Dividing lines do not appear out of nowhere. They are concrete uh, results of policy mistakes. And I think that the biggest and the first dividing line appeared just on the, on the morrow of the end of bipolarity, when post-communist peace 
was divided between two security institutions. NATO became responsible for the uh, European post-communist peace, and OSCE was, became responsible uh, for this peace east to Vienna. And immediately it created in Russia um, perception that the OEC is the second rent institution for the second rate countries, which discredited the image of this organization. I'm very glad that uh, OEC is coming back to the center of European security because, uh, but at the, at the same time, it proves that within 25 years, we did not create anything better than OSCE, which is a creation of the Cold War time. Trust, trust and mis mistrust. Again, uh, trust as well as mistrust do not appear out of nowhere. We build trust when we jointly resolve problems and disputes. My foreign colleagues, in particular Mr. Salana, always singles out the best period in terms of trust, the 90s. He always say, we're so nostalgic about the 90s when our relations were really fantastic. But if everything was so good, why it went wrong? And uh, why the democratic, the Yeltsin democratic Russia was not included in the process of NATO's enlargement? It's a big question mark. If uh, we, we had the best period uh, uh, in our relations, I think that the problem was that relations between Russia and the West were based on personal relations between Yeltsin and uh, Western leaders. The same can be said about the Bush-Putin honeymoon, which ended with the Caucasus crisis. And I think that relations between uh, countries cannot be based on personal uh, uh, relations. They should be based on common legal uh, basis. And the best period in terms of trust was uh, between the Gorbachev USSR and uh, the West, first and foremost the United States, not because of Gorbachev's nice image, not because of his nice words about new political thinking, common European house, but because we started a very serious um, process of negotiations on the most important uh, arms control issues, and we succeeded in reaching these agreements. Uh, uh, well, probably I should... Uh, Just say a couple of words. What, uh, what, what to do? First of all, we should end the conflict in Ukraine. It is number one. Uh, but even if we end this conflict, I think that uh, it will be casting a long shadow over our relations. And, um, well, under the best scenario, we could uh, have this big peace conference and to come back to unfinished job of the, of the 90s and uh, to revisit uh, the Helsinki principles, to amend them, and to start uh, negotiations between <coughs> Russia and NATO on, uh, on a new CFE treaty and on withdrawal of uh, arm, uh, armed forces of Russia and NATO around them. And probably we could persuade those countries who, um, who, have, who felt being sandwiched between the West and Russia to, to go neutral if we provide them with guarantees, security guarantees. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Bartov. I think you um, described very well um, um, the perspectives from the Russian side. Mark. Um, 
what we heard so far is that I mean, we're reading this and uh, the Ukrainian, uh, the, the, the Russian-Ukrainian conflict, um, Minsk too has to be uh, fulfilled. Um, Mrs. Panjikitsa said um, the obligations should be fulfilled, which is almost the same, also going, of course, for Georgia. Um, Mr. Charlie is going further. He says it's either neutrality or the Big Bang without a war and then we negotiate. Um, what's your perspective on that? And again, I would like to ask this simultaneously. Um, maybe for anything big, it's way too early because the wounds are too fresh. Um, Russia is not moving at the moment. Um, neither um, is the EU or the United States for different reasons. So how do you put this into perspective? Great. So in other words, asking the last person, so how do we fix all this? Um, we'll start obviously with, 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 with thanks for the invitation. Again, it seems quite appropriate that a half Italian, quarter English, quarter Irish person who works in the Czech Republic ends up representing the European perspective. I mean, let me just pull this back just, just in terms of just setting a certain context. Um, I mean, I spend a lot of my time precisely talking about the Russian threat to the West, the Russian threat to other countries, and I wouldn't want to in any way um, minimize that at the moment. But if we're in sort of this kind of a context, I think we need precisely to acknowledge that this is a, a period in which exactly that Russia also feels certain threats. And this is not just purely a rhetorical device to say, oh, we're allowed to do this because we feel a threat. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's a genuine thing that one very sort of clearly feels in, in, in Moscow and elsewhere. Um, you know, when the Russians talk about Gibridnaya Voina, hybrid war, they talk about a sort of a, a way of war that was basically made in the West and that they feel is being directed against them. We don't need to agree with them. On the other hand, we do need to accept that that is a genuinely held view amongst at least a you know, large proportion of Russian decision makers. And the other problem is that we have so many threats that we're worried about these days. I mean, at the moment, obviously, we're, we're currently focusing about the sort of new east-west thing, but elsewhere in Europe, the threat is from the south. It's from the Mediterranean and, and from North Africa. Uh, elsewhere in Russia, the long-term threat is actually from the east, whether it's instability in Central Asia or a rising China or whatever. We're almost overloaded by the very variety, plethora of threats. And often, let's be perfectly honest, when we talk about foreign threats, we are using them actually to talk about other things, characteristically domestic issues. You know, how much is the discourse about uh, Russian disinformation and its impact on the West really a way of trying to get around the fact that the West is currently going through a period of a legitimacy crisis. And it's so much more comfortable to think that the Russians done it rather than that actually that there are problems within various of Western structures, questions about the European Union and so forth. Likewise, in Russia, again, this narrative of, of Western Gibridnaya Voina attempt to undermine the sort of sovereignty of the Russian state is a handy way of demonizing protesters, demonizing any kind of opposition um, to, the, to the regime. And what this does is exactly, it, it, it continues, it, it perpetuates this notion that the in-betweeners, the countries of, of Eastern Europe, exactly that that's how they need to be defined. They're defined by the fact that they're not one or the other. They are, they are in, in, in this respect, othered. These are all sort of deeply problematic. So to move it into potential solutions, well, let me start with what for me is, is, is one of my sort of core underlying perspectives, which is, I should warn you, an exceedingly depressing one. Certainly for the next few years, what we see is what we get. I do not see scope for any substantial improvement in the relationship between the West and Russia in, exactly, as I said, the near future. The West might perhaps waver on its commitment to values-based policies, but not enough, I think, to create some sort of major shift in, 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 in the balance of power. Let's be perfectly honest. Um, Ukraine's current situation, the fact that Ukraine is not a client state of Russia, 
is down to the Ukrainians. It's not down to any Western to roll, however much we have sought to help. But likewise, I do not see there being any scope for major movement within Moscow. Um, in part, this is political. And political, psychological. I mean, I think that, that Putin believes in what he's doing. I don't think he's willing to change policies unless he felt that he was getting some kind of major victory. And the kind of major victory in Central Europe that he'll be looking for is one that is antithetical to the values of both the West the interests of the countries in question, and the whole basis of the post-1945 global order, the whole notion of sovereignty. You know, when we talk about deals that would allow forces to be withdrawn so long as Central European states accept neutrality, what we are saying is big powers should have the right to decide the security future of other powers. That Georgia, that Ukraine, that maybe someday, who knows, maybe even Belarus, should not have the right to decide its own future, or rather its right to decide its own future should be modified by the interests and the needs of the bigger powers. That is not, in my opinion, the road to go down. So, so what can we do? Do we just simply say, life's hard? No, there are things we can do, but I think precisely we need to, I think, step away from the sense that there is a big fix that all we need is, oh, for the Russians to obey international law. Well, that's not going to happen. All we need is some grand conference at which we can hammer it out. At the moment, that would not going to happen. We could have a grand conference, but we wouldn't get anywhere. Instead, my view is that actually we precisely need to be focusing on the myriad small things we can do precisely to alleviate the immediate impact of the current situation and to slowly build up trust on a very, very petty and granular level. I mean, this is, this is how the Lilliputians in, in Gulliver's travels bound Gulliver, the, to them the giant, with many, many, many small threads. So in, we should be looking at all the many issues that, that, that we can find common ground, whether it's law enforcement cooperation, whether it's, and, and let's be perfectly honest, let's be honest, Minsk is dead. Minsk was stillborn. And the longer we cling to this idea that somehow Minsk is, is someday can work out, the longer we actually stop thinking about practical measures that might actually help um, Ukraine move forward in, in, in its own reform process, but also actually address the, the killing that is happening every day along the line of contact. Likewise, Although I can feel absolute sympathy for Georgia with 20% of its um, area under, under foreign occupation in effect, it's not as though Abkhazia is going to, at some point, whether or not Moscow tells it to, is not going to say, fair enough, we'll, 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 we'll come back under Georgian control. So what can we do there? I mean, again, it's actually looking for small practical steps, bit by bit, an accretional process. Why? Because in some ways, we're thinking about the long game. We're thinking about the fact that no governments, no regimes, no geopolitical situations last forever. We are in many ways actually, in my opinion, preparing for the point where there can be scope for movement. Not thinking it's going to be tomorrow, not thinking it's going to be next year, but finding those areas of actually building trust. Because, and this is the kind of last point I'd, I would want to make. In some ways, maybe we need to be moving beyond the language of threat. Threat carries with it a certain sort of um, overarching sense that the other side, whoever the other side is, is bad. Is actually someone with whom we can find no common ground. I'm always amazed when I travel in, in Russia how much common ground there is on a human level. Not least the fact that although from time to time the Kremlin likes to use the language of Eurasia, Russians regard themselves as Europeans, and as far as I'm concerned, Russians are Europeans too. There, 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 there are massive sort of reasons to try and get, get beyond this. Maybe we, we need to be talking about, or however sort of flabby it sounds, about the language of disagreement. When Russia does things that, for example, the West is unhappy with, we should respond, and frankly, I think we should respond much more vigorously and much more toughly than we have a tendency to do but we should respond about the specific action. This is not about demonizing Russia. This is about responding to particular things that, that, that Russia does. 
Because otherwise, what happens is we, we just simply entrench the situation. Look, why ultimately is Russia in the Donbass? It's because it felt that, in a way, it was going to lose Ukraine. Anything that encourages this Manichaean sense of that this is not about Ukraine or Georgia or Belarus, it's about some grand geopolitical competition, will continue to keep the in-betweeners the in-betweeners and continue to keep this conflict running. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Mark. Um, what you just said at the very end, I think it has to do something with inoffensive defense. Um, making sure that wherever the defense is, is not seen as offensive. Um, I have one more question for the uh, participants and then I would like to open it up. Um, I know it's quoted very often and possibly you're all bored because the majority of you also work for the OSCE, but I'm sorry I do it again. I'm quoting out of the uh, uh, Paris Carter. On the one hand side it says, with the ending of the division of Europe, we will strive for a new quality in our security relations while fully respecting each other's freedom of choice in that respect. Clearly understood. But the second part, I think this is what somebody said before, a difference between possibly NATO and OSCE. The second part of this paragraph says, security is indivisible and the security of every participating state is inseparably linked to that of all the others. Now this is important because if one country sees this is not the case, what do we do? If this is the foundation, then I would like to ask all of you, um, what could be a legal framework or some understanding for the countries of the Eastern Partnership which provides at the same time security and prosperity. What is it? Is it NATO membership under these circumstances? Is it something different? What is it? What should be the framework for the countries they deciding but also seeing the framework where they're working it? What could it be? Um. We heard uh, a lot uh, here about different inter interpretations of uh, the West uh, and Russia on different issues. But nobody is asking us what is our... Right <laughs> yes. now. And thank you for the question. That was <laughs> what I wanted to say. What is our interpretation? What is good for us? Um, you mentioned in the beginning the Eastern Partnership, uh, which was introduced for six countries. You named the countries. And uh, I'm very proud to say that Georgia is champion in the Eastern Partnership with the achievements, with the signature of association agreement and the DCFTA, and also with the visa-free regime, which I enjoyed yesterday uh, when I came uh, to Prague uh, first time. And it's really uh, something uh, very special for uh, Georgian people. Um, our interpretation of our future is the membership in the EU and NATO. That's the foreign political choice of Georgia, supported by the majority of Georgian population, and every Georgian government since our independence tried to go in this direction and to integrate the country into the European and Euro-Atlantic structures. Um, when, uh, He's, he was said that uh, maybe a neutral status and the security guarantee can be a solution uh, for a country like Georgia because of the different interpretations from the West and from Russia. Uh, I don't think that uh, this uh, issue can be discussed in Georgia today. But in 10 years maybe when we have uh, um, reintegrated uh, Abkhazia and South Ossetia and when Georgia's territorial integrity and sovereignty is respected by every other country among them Russia, maybe it can be a topic of discussion then if it happens. But today we believe that NATO is necessary for the security of Georgia and the European perspective is important for the economic and democratic development of the country. That's a very clear message which has every Georgian government and, is, um, and the Georgian population is in favor of this perspective. Um, and, and one, more, one little question, is this a bargaining position saying this is the maximum and then we'll see within the years and maybe we come up with, everything, with something else? Is that you feel you cannot, you, this, is, yeah, this is the maximum, this is what you want? Yeah, that's the maximum what we want, uh, and I'm sure that uh, the situation will not be changed uh, 
in the next future, and this will stay our foreign political goals. Mr. Charlie, what about you? Uh, look, I'm a professor of public international law, and I look at this situation in very realistic terms. Practically, now, indivisibility of borders uh, not work. Only you, our moderator, so brave that you remember about it. Because it's it, it, it a good culture to discuss invisibility of border among uh, such a level of conference. And practically, practically, after 2004, the big enlargement of NATO in 2004 and big enlargement of EU in 2004 was the last when exists tacit consent between Russia and the West concerning this is deal. After this, all action was unilateral. And from this point of view, when concerning the Georgia case, what happens? But West not react. So now in my mind, West totally not recognized in the visibility of borders because he declared door is open and every nation have a right to choose. And the Russia very clear declare if you go across red line, we have a right to divide any country. So, uh, and now all countries between is divided. Ukraine, the last case, because unfortunately, unbalanced foreign policy also lead to the tragedy. And to my mind concerning the free choice, I want to give you a test question. Ukraine have a free choice for security mode. We very clear declare that we want to be member of NATO. In 2008, as foreign advisor of President Yushchenko, I prepared Bucharest summit and I was there. We meet all requirements, but we receive no. Now we receive where we are, aggression, division of territory. We, and I also participate in this process, signed Budapest Memorandum. We receive guarantees from P5. It's a very sensitive document for a non-proliferation. Strategically very sensitive. And we receive no. Now we ask NATO to help us with weapons. Answer, zero. We ask United States, our strategic guarantee, to help us with weapons. Answer, zero. Inside of the country, radicalism rose every day. Now, five political parties, who may, I'm sure three of them will be in future parliament, declare necessity to return back to nuclear status. I ask all of you, it will be security choice of Ukraine to return to nuclear status, according with your declaration that every nation have a right to choose security status, country who gave up that nuclear stockpile. Now, when you not implement effectively, according to our view, your guarantees or assurance concerning the Budapest Memorandum, we have a right to renew our nuclear status. When new political forces to come to the parliament, it's reality now, it's political program of parties. So, to play with words, very accurate. And another argument to you. You remember Belarus. Belarus member seized you all. Belarus member of Union with Russia. Belarus member of Eurasian Union. S geopolitical and geoeconomic status of Belarus 100 defined. If you so easy speak about Belarus as possible member of NATO, Russia can very easily to speak about Bulgaria as a possible member of CSTO. Are you agree with this? Or Macedonia, or Chernogoria, but now it's another case, or Serbia. Be sure now for Russia not exist any red lines. And she proposed you the same. For us countries in between is the most dangerous scenario. You playing among with them, but playing with our destiny, with our territory. So, my only appeal to all of you, the great, conclude peace, finally, and, and Cold War, because Cold War not ended with a formal peace. 
and stop struggle over us. Give us some status. I am not insist on neutrality. Maybe it will be some other status. In our report, we give a few, a few examples. But if no, if no, be honest. Situation practically on the field, as you like to tell, that every day we create a new Berlin war in Ukraine. Two months ago, we declared blockade economic. Three weeks ago, we blockade TV station. Two days ago, we blockade all internet. Every day, we create war with Russia in the east of Ukraine. So if it's reality, if it's reality, let's go to this scenario and start to renegotiate Helsinki Act. Because Paris, it's about cooperative security. It's totally killed. Helsinki Act, it's about uh, structured security. It's about division, but regulated division, predictable division of security in Europe. But we need to out of this is stupid choice, neither peace, neither war, which lead all of us to big security tragedy in Europe, the whole Europe, including Russia. Mrs. Panjikita said it's NATO and it's EU. So for Ukraine, it is, according to your understanding, possibly neutrality. This is one option which you mentioned for prosperity and security. Well, for me, I'm a professional as, as diplomat. If political mandate, I receive inside of the country for some uh, coordinated status, like for Budapest Memorandum, I'm sure I reach results. Concerning the EU, three years I was Secretary of State for European Integration. In 2004, I declared we have no chance to be a member of EU even if we implement all the key communautaire for excellence, for very simple reason. And it, I was explaining in Paris and in Spain because of Russia and because you not create problem for us. Because I asked why Western Bal Balkans receive perspectives. It was for us totally unexpected. So I answered to my French colleague, we have two problems. We never create problems for you and Russia, our neighbor. The first problem we have decided, we create problems for all of you, for Russia and for, uh, for EU. But Russia exists and you in your security or European integration <laughs> policy, you take Russia seriously, I'm sure. But to my mind, we have two options, to divide and then to try to reestablish through pro new Helsinki process, or if it's, po it's possible to start immediately from Paris Charter, because Paris Charter, it's about another story. It's about cooperative security. Okay, Mrs. Abartova. Um, First, we asked the two representatives of the countries in between. Now, how could you see uh, a way out in terms for the six countries? I understand they're very different. We don't have to mention this all the time. Um, how, could, how could you see a, a prosperous and a secure future for um, those six countries? Uh, first of all, I don't understand why Alexander <laughs> has got so excited about my, <laughs> my point. Uh, well, I, I didn't want to hurt you. No, no, you, you said that there is a contradiction, uh, my third contradiction, which I mentioned, the contradiction of uh, nation's right to freely choose security alliances and nation's right to organize their security on their territory uh, along, uh, according to their threat perceptions, including uh, expansion of these alliances. That's what I have said. This contradiction exists, like it or not. Uh, as for uh, future status, of course, a neutrality uh, of uh, six Eastern partners uh, would be because um, Armenia and Bela Belarus are no four, four Guam of Guam countries would be the best choice. But of course it's not realistic to have a new Yalta and to decide the future of the states over their heads. This should be uh, decided uh, within the framework of this peace conference. Uh, no other choice. As for uh, membership in NATO, you know, I think that uh, this uh, membership looks very attractive in peacetime. 
and there is a kind of paradox uh, between security and insecurity being NATO's member. Look at the sea countries. They joined NATO because they wanted to be secure. But just imagine if a big conflict uh, erupts, they will find themselves at the forefront of the military confrontation. And uh, I think that uh, the biggest problem with NATO's enlargement is that it was the ill-conceived decision. If Russia had been invited to become a NATO member, or even if we had started negotiations on Russia's would-be membership, on the terms and timetable of this uh, would-be membership, the situation would have uh, been completely different. And when Putin, President Putin, after 9-11, when Russia contributed even more than some of NATO's countries to the anti-terrorist coalition, when he came to Brussels, he said in public, I have this quote from his speech, uh, we, we are ready to reconsider um, our attitudes to, towards NATO's enlargement if it is expanded to Russia. Very simple. And what was NATO's answer? Thank you, no. So, uh, once again, I think that neutrality status, but uh, it should be accepted. It cannot be imposed by force on these countries. So. Thank you very much. Mark, um, um, how could you see those six countries, even though they're different, or? maybe three or four of them, so they have a prosperous and a secure status. Yeah, I mean, when it comes down to it, it's precisely, it's that they each have the right to decide their own security future. Um, and I think the, the, the role of other states should not simply be to just simply, as it were, negatively say, fine, you have that right, but actually actively to support them in that. You know, we don't have to be military allies in order to actually support them in, in, in building up their own security apparatuses and structures, which doesn't just simply mean tanks and guns. I mean, th there is a whole sort of wider realm of, of, of security that we need to be thinking about. So, I mean, I think, in a way, the, the, the first requirement is precisely that these countries be in a position to, you know, I wouldn't say defend themselves, because, you know, again, with the best will in the world, it, it's hard to think of Georgia being able to fight the, you know, Russia, the Russian Federation to a standstill, however much assistance one provides. Um, so it's, so it, it's not just simply saying more or less, well, there, there you go, you, you be on your own. But nonetheless, it, it, it's building up capacity, first of all. Secondly, it, it is, I think, precisely about um, making it clear that this is not a straightforward binary. There is a tendency at the moment to assume, look, if you're a NATO member, that's kind of, that's the solid gold membership card. You know, then, you know, absolutely your other allies will, will come to your assistance. If you're outside NATO, or, and, and certainly in, in including sort of being outside the European Union, because obviously there's, there's Finland and Sweden, for example, who are women. But, you know, if you're outside, ah, well, never mind. You know, you're on your own. Um, I mean, I, I think that there is scope to provide all kinds of guarantees. And again, I mean, I, I would once again go back to where what we're trying to do is create a kind of a web work of relatively small scale things, you know, not some grand declaration. Because grand declarations are only as effective as they are credible. Um, and this is one of the, you know, this is one of the reasons why there is concerns, for example, about Georgian membership of NATO. No one questions whether the Georgians have done everything that is necessary to build themselves up to NATO interoperability, NATO standards and so forth. Just there are some countries that are actually saying, we're not sure if there is a political will that if you know, Russia rolled into Georgia, we're not sure if actually we honestly could mobilize that kind of support needed for, 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 for a true response. And if that happens, then it undermines the whole unity of NATO as a whole. So, so in a way, let, let's not look for kind of grand declaratory stuff. Let's look for ways of supporting these countries in the, so that they're in a position to make their own decisions 
And as I said, looking at security broadly conceptualized. So that also includes economic security, it also includes cultural security, it also includes counterintelligence and all the sort of the covert forms. Thank you very much. Um, just a sec. Um, there's the OSCE, of course, is in the forefront, so to speak. They have the structured dialogue. Um, um, it has started um, in April. It will continue. Mr. Alla was talking about it. Um, I just would like that you keep this in mind. Possibly um, uh, we'll come back to that. But now I definitely would like to open uh, the floor. And there was a question over there. Two questions over there. So I don't know whether mics are here in the middle row. If you could, yes. Very good. And please introduce yourself yeah. um, shortly. Uh, thank you. Uh, I represent uh, Foreign Minister of Belarus, and uh, it is Belarus and not Belarusia, please. Um, and um, um, uh, I want to comment uh, on some of your uh, remarks uh, made here. Uh, you mentioned uh, that uh, Belarus is a, in a close alliance with Russia, uh, that we, are, we have a union uh, state with Russia. Well, yes, uh, we have very close relations with Russia. It's quite natural, historically, economically, culturally. We are very close, we are brother nations. And uh, well, uh, uh, this is, but it doesn't mean uh, that, well, but at the same time we are independent states. And uh, Belarus is an independent state and a uh, uh, state which have um, uh, uh, the opinions which uh, uh, not always coincide with the opinion of Russian Federation and uh, the Ukraine and Georgia is a good example of uh, this independent st stance on different issues and we try to explain to our Russian partners why uh, we follow this position uh, and uh, uh, you some of you uh, mentioned them probably Mr. Erler mentioned that uh, uh, we should feel a uh, threat from one side or another. You know, if uh, you ask uh, the people in Belarus uh, from which side they feel uh, the threat, uh, they would not point, uh, the majority of the people would not point to Russia. Uh, that would, uh, they would point to uh, other countries uh, where uh, uh, the uh, NATO pres presence is growing and uh, it's difficult to them to, uh, to explain that this is a defensive nature as uh, Mr. Erl put it. Uh, so what we need, I mean the countries in between we, which want to have close relationship with Russia but at the same time uh, we are eager to normalize relations with the European Union, we want to, clo uh, to have close links with the European Union, what is quite natural as well. But what we need in these uh, well, turbulent times, uh, we need uh, uh, information exchange. We need to understand and to explain to our people why uh, the NATO presence is growing in uh, NATO and our bordering uh, states. Since we have, uh, as Belarus, we have more than 1,000 kilometers uh, bo uh, common border with the European Union. So, that, thank that you very much for that comment. Ambassador, you are. Could you please the, give the microphone to the Russian ambassador? Thank you very much. Uh, I do not want to monopolize once again the right to repeat the same things, but OEC security days, uh, days for security talks, how to secure our continent. This is not once again an attempt to divide the continent. And uh, I know those tricks on enlargement or security arrangements, but you quote just a part of the concept. Of course, it's free, but with all due respect to legitimate security concern of other states, that's the point. With all due respect, Minister, uh, <laughs> in Geneva international discussions, and before that, the deal which was made with the <coughs> European Union on Georgia, it was a proposition for the Russian Federation to define the status of those territories in those discussions, not to leave this process alone. But it was a rejection, a rejection from your side. So, uh, and, uh, answer very shortly. And, uh, and of course, of course, on, on Ukraine, definitely, it's it's more than 
uh, Minsk package of measures. It's disengagement rules, it's uh, withdrawal of troops with OEC auspices and JCCC. So we have a lot of arrangements already made. <laughs> Let's finalize it. And of course, don't kill this baby, which is growing OEC from CEC to OEC with those gentlemen who are working in Vienna and trying very hard to confine all those approaches in, I mean, with all participating states. And the, the last point, OEC has erased all these divisions. We are all 57 now with Mongolia. Uh, equal participating states, no West, no Russia, no perhaps in some of the discussions, but the concept is given, the concept is made. Let's try to consolidate it. Thank you. Yeah, everybody has a chance to answer. I, I, this is actually not the way it works, Mr. Ambassador, but I have a question back to you because I think this is important. Excuse me, could you please? Yes. So your voice is, um, you're saying basically the OSC is a good thing. What we hear from Moscow is the OSC is obsolete, um, the Paris Carter is out, the KSC Helsinki is something of the past. So you're saying Russia is standing firmly on the KSC final act and on the uh, Paris Carter and Astana and so on and so forth, correct? No. <laughs> Can you give me just one example of those statements? Who made them? We cherish the OSC and the uh, that was when crisis in Ukraine broke. So it was <laughs> our president invited OEC to, to interfere, to interfere with the main goal of easing tension, trying to secure this crisis as soon as possible. So OEC is in place with a special monitoring group and uh, we're trying to do our best, but <laughs> we never bury it. it, it it's our, actually, it's our baby. How can we kill it? I mean, OEC in the center. And it That's has it. always been a conceptual position of the Russian Federation and the Soviet Union that the whole uh, European security structure should be based first and foremost on the OEC principles. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Ambassador, for that clarification. Um, why don't we start there and then we go, yeah, second row, exactly, then we go to the very back. And here I think we need also some women voices. And then we go over there. And you're the last one. I hope this will work out. Please. Yeah, thank you. Um, I, I would think that um, yeah, what we heard from the uh, panelists, uh, I suppose the most realistic way it was proposed by Mark Galeotti. Uh, I mean the, the way of small steps. And uh, I hope that even Russia might, uh, might accept this way. Uh, and. Uh, and uh, perhaps this is the way out. But uh, the question that Mark uh, himself answered is, uh, the, uh, is Russia the uh, European country? Uh, and he answered clearly yes. I would like to hear this answer from Russians themselves. Uh, and it's not uh, only about, about the declaration that I'm, I'm European, but it is uh, more about the values. Uh, and uh, I was a, a, a Lithuanian representative uh, um, uh, to the Council of Europe uh, in the 90s. And the Council of Europe is an <coughs> organization that is a, considered as a guardian of, of, of those European values. And uh, what answer we heard uh, from Russia then, uh, uh, when, when it was uh, here discussed what was the answer from, from the West to Russia, but from, from Russia we had answer to those questions by the voices of uh, Mr. Uh, Zuganov and Mr. Zhirinovsky. So this was uh, um, a kind of a answer we, we had and uh, uh, whether uh, with such an answer is it possible, uh, because NATO is also based on the same values, uh, is it possible to, uh, to uh, think about the future uh, of, uh, of uh, ally in, in NATO, which, uh, which uh, uh, talks with, uh, uh, with the, um, us with the voices of, of Zuganov and Zhirinovsky. Th thank you very much. Um, there was one in the last row, please, and also introduce yourself quickly. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you for giving me the floor. I'm from the 
uh, uh, permanent mission of Azerbaijan to the OSC. And thank you for all uh, uh, organizing this specific panel, which was specifically focused on, on those countries that don't, don't belong to any military bloc. And my country, Azerbaijan, uh, is one of the few uh, such countries. And uh, we, we appreciated the very, very uh, sincere uh, discussions on, on, on very specific problems and very specific security challenges that face these, uh, these countries. Uh, actually, um, our Azerbaijan, our delegation has been uh, one of the few countries, uh, few uh, OEC participating states that advocated for proper analysis, proper uh, listening to the concerns of, the, of the, these non-aligned countries and proper reflection of their concerns in the work of the OSCE. And this happened well before the crisis in, in Ukraine erupted and the ch shaken the, the European security order. Uh, the, the, the problem of non-aligned countries, their status is very uh, well known and the panelists uh, elaborated on this issue. But uh, what I see a risk and what I see something uh, that I cannot accept is just to, to deal these four countries, uh, non-aligned countries, as object not the subject of international relations. We are talking about uh, neutrality, some kind of uh, status for, for these countries, but we, can, we, we have to accept that these countries, uh, for example, I, I have to, uh, to talk on, on our behalf, Azerbaijan is a full-fledged member of international community, is a full-fledged participating state, and it's up to, to it. To, uh, to decide whether it, it's going to be neutral or part of it. Any, any bloc. If the OECE or international community tries to, wants to, to help these countries, it is to, uh, to listen to these countries, what are the problems? And the problem is violated sovereignty and territorial integrity. And I think it's common for, for all these four countries. And what I see from, uh, from this discussion is a kind of a great uh, so-called grand bargain uh, between the opposing blocs or opposing great powers on this, uh, on these uh, countries at the expense of their security, at the expense of the uh, sovereignty and territorial integrity. So, yes, we have to discuss the, uh, the, the issue of non-aligned countries, but we have to respect to their interests. And this is, if the OEC and the international community wants to contribute to, 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 to solving these problems, this is the way how to ensure the violated territorial integrity and sovereignty of this state. Thank you very this much. Is the, this is the way that OEC can contribute, Th and I would uh, like to, to uh, the panel to elaborate on this very specific issue. OEC has been mandated to solve this problem. No, we know that, uh, but we still yeah, have other yeah. people also would Thank like you. to say something. I think Thank you make you. your point fabulously. Thank you very much. And uh, actually, we have two uh, representatives of two countries of the Eastern Partnership. I think there is no doubt that this has been done so exactly there is nothing over the head, but it's exactly the country themselves decide. Okay, there was one over there, one um, uh, okay. intervention. Thank you for giving me the floor. Um, I'm from the OSCE Secretariat, and I wanted to ask this question actually to Ambassador Lukashevich on the first panel, but I was too slow. So I think it also ties in here, and I would like to ask Mrs. Arbatova, what, from a Russian perspective, could be concrete steps that NATO could take to like regain trust maybe or to solve the situation you're in, not just like abiding by law, by commitments, that's very general, but like concrete steps that could be taken maybe in the next month to kind of move forward and um, by whom could they maybe be taken? Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, I have you and I have you, but I, uh, I think that will be difficult. I mean, you have always had a chance, so I would like to um, ask Ambassador Paul because uh, there was the idea to say a little bit about the structured dialogue and I think the structured dialogue would fit here perfectly and after that you can beat me up later during the coffee break. Um, I would come back to the panelists um, and they will then uh, wrap the session up. Uh, Ambassador Paul, please. Yeah, thank you very much for, for giving the floor to me. Now, I think we heard a discussion which was uh, very fundamental addressing uh, issues like conflicts which are of course, fundamental and security architecture. And um, well, the structured dialogue is, of course, rather on Mr. Gagliotti's side. It's the no big fix uh, way forward. It's the web working way forward. It's about uh, 
identifying islands of cooperation in an extremely difficult environment. I think that was the approach taken by ministers in December when, and I think this was really a great achievement, uh, sorry to say as a German, <laughs> of the Hamburg ministerial ministers uh, succeeded in agreeing on a text which they couldn't do for several years, on a text which made the point about arms control, about CSBMs being essential for Europe, and they made the point about the erosion of this very fundamental security a key and launch the structured dialogue. So clearly, the structured dialogue is different from certain processes before, be it Corfu or Helsinki 40. The focus is Paul Mill, and the focus is on creating a conducive environment to stop the erosion of cooperative security and even more so try to sort of address fundamental security concerns through CSBMs and maybe arms control. So that said, of course, it was not an easy decision to take. It was also controversial in the given broader environment. But I think it was a positive sign. And if I may sort of make a brief excursion to other areas, I think the OSCE, in a very sort of stormy waters, turbulent times, as was said, tries to identify islands of cooperation and has been successful, for example, in the cyber area, ag agreeing on two sets of CSBMs. Of course, it's conceptually an extremely difficult environment to work on CSPMs in the cyber field, but there was room for agreement. Work is being done in the second dimension, work is being done on some other issues, successfully islands of cooperation. But I believe the text from Hamburg on Paul Mill is probably the most uh, substantial uh, political process, uh, political in the narrow sense process underway. Now, what's the scope? Um, when ministers agreed on that text, yes, the point was made about erosion of uh, cooperative security and returning to more trust and security. Clearly, the setting is the broader Paul Mill context, and the point was made by many who hesitated to start a narrow process going straight towards arms control and CSBMs. So it's a fundamental process of discussion with a clear sense of direction, which I mentioned. At the same time, it has to take on board concerns of the wider Paul Mill context. Now, if I may, a few more remarks. Uh, mention was made just uh, a few minutes ago, concerns, for example, of Belarus when it comes to military postures. I think similar voices were heard before. So I think one fundamental issue we have been discussion, uh, discussing up to now is threat perceptions, military doctrines, which in many ways reflect perceptions, threats, and posture, we are discussing early June. And I think those three elements together, seen together, can help uh, to move to, towards a better understanding of the real security situation, trying to address threats, misperceptions. It's some way to go, it's a difficult task, and I think it is worthwhile giving different perceptions to engage in a kind of mapping exercise, trying to better understand what is really happening in Europe in the security realm. And um, I hope, again, in the, in the same vein as Mr. Galliotti, uh, trying to do web working, trying to find a consensus way forward in this area, I believe it can set the stage for maybe more security, more trust, and more islands. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, now we have the final round. I would suggest we do the same, actually, Ms. Tajikitian. <laughs> I understand they all want to have very, to very say a lot. Very, very shortly. Short, exactly. And, uh, excuse my emotionality, and uh, because we are the country suffering and from the development. That's why you have the voice. Uh, first of all, uh, let me uh, pick up some uh, points made by the Russian ambassador. Russia recognized the independence of South Ossetia and Abkhazia just 10 days after the war, and Geneva was established later. So there was no chance to discuss the status of uh, these two occupied regions in Geneva. Um, um, the second point is, uh, you said that the instruments are on the ground. I agree, but the instruments cannot be used because uh, all the instruments are not effective. 
uh, Geneva, for example, the best achievement, the biggest achievement of uh, Geneva uh, international talks, of uh, the rounds of uh, Geneva are to fix the date for the next round because nothing can be agreed uh, in Geneva. And uh, there are uh, some uh, things uh, we could uh, make immediately. For example, uh, the non-use of force pledge, uh, which was uh, done by Georgia two times and is legally binding, and Russia refused to make the same. A second example, the EU monitoring mission, which has mandate to uh, control the whole territory of Georgia, but they have no access to the occupied regions because the Russian troops are standing on the uh, so-called border. Uh, these are the two examples which can be done fast and uh, help to build trust, uh, of course. And the second point, OEC is a fantastic organization and we, we should repeat it several times uh, here. Uh, and we are um, very much uh, in favor of re-establishing the OSCE mission in Georgia, but it's not possible because of the Russian uh, position. Another proposal, help to restore the OSCE mission in Georgia. It will contribute to the peace building and to the better uh, security environment in the region. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Charlie. Three short observations. First of all, I am strongly supporter of OSCE. So, I propose to look strategically and I propose idea of summit because I'm sure, as a former practical diplomat, that key problem now for OEC, for General Secretary, lack of the highest political will to find any solution. So, if we put idea of the summit, and I, I'm sure it's very possible after re-election, new old chancellor in Germany, and new old president in Russia. Wait, wait, I think wait. we have a very good idea and window of opportunities for such summit in middle of April. Second observation. Uh, of course, any choice of security model which can be discussed during the preparation of this summit, because preparatory work will be the very, very essential. It will be fighting of very broad compromise. I'm sure that any security formula for Ukraine will be supported by Ukrainian nation. I'm sure. Like Adenauer refused the Soviet Union proposal reunification of Germany uh, with preconditions of neutrality of Germany, but he refused it and Germany followed the division scenario. And to my mind, my idea, the most dangerous scenario, even for Russia, this is neither peace, neither war in Donbass. Criminality, environment, knows no borders. We have to stop it. If division permit us to stop it, and summit of OECE follow this way, okay, it's good. And third, but very important, in any scenario, reunification under some special status or division under recon reconformation of new Helsinki Act, and it will be very symbolic that this the place of this new summit will be in Kiev. I think it will be very encouraging and very symbolic, not in Minsk. Excuse me, please, my Belarusian friends. That's no, it? Belarus friends. And finally, finally, but Ukrainian territorial integrity in borders of 1991, it's question without any discussion. But it's possible. I remember you that Helsinki Act was signed when three Baltic states were part of Soviet Union. But agree in availability of borders was very clear understanding that all Western countries not recognize that the Baltic states are part of the Soviet Union. So we can implement this as historical precedent even to find a strategic solution for very difficult questions inside of CIS countries. Thank you very much. Ms. Nabatova, final word, short. Uh, first, there was a question to me what uh, Russia and NATO should do. I think that uh, First of all, they should uh, agree on, uh, on a declaration or better on a treaty about uh, unintended incidents because it's the major threat to in international security escalation of unintended incidents. Second, they could uh, focus on confidence building measures in addition to 
uh, open skies and uh, Vienna document regimes. And under the best there, uh, they could start negotiations on a new um, uh, CFE treaty. I would like to, uh, to give a short comment on, s uh, on the small steps approach, which is very liked by bureaucratic institutions because uh, this approach creates impression that everything is going on. I would not be against this approach if we have a clear vision of our common future and uh, finality of this common step approach. And my last point about uh, Georgia. I think that Russia would have never recognized South uh, Ossetia and Abkhazia's independence if Mr. Uh, Sak President Saakashvili had not rejected the last point of the first peace plan delivered by Sarkozy. And the last point of this uh, first version was about negotiations uh, about the future status of South Ossetia and Abkhazia. President Saakashvili did not want even to doubt the status of South Ossetia and Abkhazia, but if he had accepted this point, uh, the negotiations on the status would have been going on. <laughs> Possibly. Mark. Very briefly, I mean, I think bringing together the various sort of points that have been raised um, in this session and, and, and around the room, I think, it, to me, it very much underlines the enduring value and role of the, of the OSCE. Um, you know, it, it is clear that there cannot be, and nor should there be, some kind of Yalta 2.0. Firstly, because exactly mm -hmm. what it says about, you know, essentially treating certain nations as objects rather than actors in their own right. And secondly, because on a much more kind of pragmatic geopolitical level, um, you know, we should recognize that while, while Russia can be a very challenging neighbor, um, it is not a global superpower. It is a country with an economy smaller than Spain's, which yes, is, is, is nuclear, and yes, because it's, a, it's a, um, not a democratic regime, can focus resources and act much more effectively, but you know, this is, we, we also have to recognize the, sort of the, the geopolitical realities. But the point is, we are, like it or not, stuck at the moment in, in this new Cold War, call it what you will. The OSCE does therefore have a role precisely as being an institution that is outside of that east-west conflict, or at least can be, should be outside that. It stretches beyond the quote-unquote battleground zones. It precisely, it stretches all the way across to Vladivostok. And in that respect, one of the key challenges, I think, will be uh, making sure that the OSCE avoids just simply becoming yet another forum for the same, you're the bad guys, no, you're the bad guys, um, disagreements that, that take place. And I think events like this really shall show that. Thank you very much. Okay, we'll come to an end. I think if uh, the OSCE wanted to have a panel on uh, reassurance, you got it. Uh, all of them uh, said that the OSC is very important. Um, I would end um, with what I said at the very beginning, um, the transparency of intention. I think this is an underlying theme which we heard today too. Um, the intentions are not quite clear and uh, I also think that the OSC is a good um, organization to um, come to terms with that. Otherwise, we got a plethora of ideas um, and um, I think a couple of um, ideas possibly put together um, might be valuable uh, for reports written by all the uh, embassies home. Uh, so I think it's worth it. I think it was a very open discussion. Um, thank you very much. Um, the only thing I can offer you now is first of all, thank the uh, panelists, please. That was a great discussion. And the second is the lunch is served outside, which is a good thing. I think the, the stairs downstairs. Thank you very much.